Hi, my name is Mike, and I'm one of the pastors here at Kings Harbor. Thank you so much for joining us for this online message. Here's our hope that as you hear the word of God preached, that you would see Jesus more clearly and love him more deeply. And so over the next few moments, take notes, focus, and hear how the word of God is going to transform you. Reading from the epistle to the church in Galatia, Galatians 3, 10 through 14. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. The word of the Lord. Worship team, thank you. Jason, thank you for reading. Um, as we've walked through the service, um, Good Friday is the day that um, we, like those who experienced it the first time, descend into the darkness of the death of Jesus. And so even as we walk through the service, you're going to feel it getting progressively darker to kind of uh, stir your emotions, not just your intellect about what you're entering into. And I can think about moments in my life when I've had to think through the weight of what this day means. I was standing in the Curtis Colwell Gar Garland Event Center in Dallas, Texas in 2008, and I was part of a, an Easter presentation, and I was dressed in full firefighter, or a full firefighter's rig, my face uh, covered with makeup made to look like ash as if I were one of the firefighters that was standing at ground zero right after September 11th. Now, we were far enough away from the real events of September 11th that it was a bit of a memory, but it was close enough that it was right under the surface that we could feel the pain. And I started that event in a dark room like this with a crowd of people like you and had the opportunity to share a monologue as if I was one of those firefighters who had been on the scene, seeing the innocent loss of life and trying to wrestle through it. And I can remember that the very end of that monologue, my last line was, somebody's got to pay. I can also think of back in 2019, I had the opportunity to be part of, of an event to, to honor Dr. John Perkins. And it was in the uh, newly opened Civil Rights Museum of Mississippi. And as you walk through that, there's this centerpiece exhibit that looks like a tree. And then uh, hanging on posts next to the tree are just monoliths of names of people from Mississippi that were lynched, that were hung from a tree. And it was this identity piece that allowed people to recognize there's something broken in the world that we live in. And that's the tie between the two stories. That whether it's the firefighter uh, or pretending to be the firefighter from 9-11 or being somebody that's walking through an exhibit of our nation's history, that there are these moments of tragedy that we see that make it apparent to the rest of the world that something's not right. But very rarely do those moments that are tragedies also fix the problem that it's identifying. And when we step into Good Friday, Good Friday has the power to do both. And so here's the simple main idea for us. The death of Jesus breaks the curse of sin and death. So Jason just read for you out of the book of Galatians and Paul's writing a letter. And actually what he's doing is he's trying to answer this pressing question. There's really a question that leads to a question. And the question that he's trying to answer is who is part of the people of God? But the question behind being the people of God is who gets to know what blessing and flourishing and life is versus who knows separation and death and, and the lack of fruitfulness. And so he's trying to answer this question and in the way that he's wrestling through the question, he is uh, well aware that there are some people that are trying to figure out how to do this in their own power. And so when you step into verse 10 and he makes the statement that those who live by the law know that everyone who lives under the law is also cursed by it. He's, he's entering us into this difficult conversation. Let me summarize Paul's words. You can't fix this. 
Uh, there's this sin problem that you and I have that we can't fix by being better. We can't fix by trying harder. We can't fix by doing all the external things and all the activity, like that won't work. And so what he's actually referring to is in Deuteronomy, Moses is walking through, okay, if you're the people of God, here's what you're committed to. When you keep the covenant, you receive life and fullness and blessing. When you break the covenant, you are recursed. And, and the very verse that he's quoting is like, unless you keep all of the law, there's curses for you. Now, the first five books of the Bible are, help, are, are meant to help you understand and wrap your arms around the law. Um, I don't have time today to walk through all five of those books in detail. However, I would say if we were going to try and identify the law, we could at least just start with the Ten Commandments that you're probably familiar with, and we could just do a little diagnostic. That if not keeping any part of the law at all times is an issue, then I think we got a little bit of trouble. And so, uh, you know, now there's some that I, I, I hope and assume is not true of you, like thou shalt not murder. I think we're probably good in the room. But let me just go to an easier one. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Like, it, like none of us are going to raise our hand and be like, I've never lied before. And if you do, welcome to the club because you're a liar. And so his point is, if you, if you who know the law can't keep the law, then it's actually identifying a problem. It's not fixing the problem. That if you, with all your effort, are trying to do the best to keep the law and you're not able to do it, that, it's, that actually identifies the curse that's before you, not a freedom that's before you. And then he would go a step further and he would say, you have to recognize that the righteous live by faith. Now, that statement, the righteous live by faith, we, you see it a lot in the New Testament, but actually where it starts is this man named Habakkuk who's a prophet who's actually frustrated with the Lord. Because the Lord has sent the wickedness of the world, this tragedy to happen to expose how broken and wicked the people of God really are. And he's like, Lord, you can fix us, but don't do it this way. And in the midst of recognizing that, he said, okay, I don't get all of this. I don't understand why there's this suffering, this brokenness and this trouble. I can't see it, but what I know is that the righteous are supposed to live by faith. So it's interesting that Paul would say that your own effort isn't going to make you right, righteous, holy, and remove the curse. But those who live by faith attain the status of righteous and whole and the people of God because they live by faith. And isn't that the secret power of sin? That somehow it convinces you that if you try harder and work more that you're going to defeat it and you're really just wearing yourself out. And isn't that where it gets its strength in the first place? I think that's the case because Paul would go out of his way to make a statement to say, but Jesus became a curse for us because everyone who's cursed hangs upon a tree. Now, um, that, that language is interesting. And, we, and if you've been with us, if you were with us last Sunday, if you'll be with us on Easter Sunday, we're going to keep walking through this kind of uh, this agricultural idea of the way that uh, trees point to flourishing. And it's interesting that in all the ways that he wanted to talk about what Jesus did, that he would point to Jesus being hung on a tree as becoming cursed. Um, I think there's a reality that in that day and age, the, the crucifixion was meant to be this, uh, this humiliation. That to be beaten and hung naked in front of the public to see um, that it was this death that was given over to criminals, that that idea was meant to humil humiliate you. Um, it was called the death of a thousand deaths, but it was also meant to be this idea of you are a coward and a scourge to society. You should be humiliated, be hung publicly, be executed publicly in front of the world around you. And so, of, co of course, there's a level of cursedness that comes from that, a level of shame that comes from that. But what Paul's quoting here actually also comes out of Deuteronomy. And in Deuteronomy, what he's quoting, he's actually quoting Moses telling them about, if somebody commits a crime that's punishable by death, here's what you need to do. You need to place them upon the tree. And so let me read that to you. It says this, um, if a man has committed a crime punishable by, by, by death and he is put to death and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day. For a hanged man is cursed by death. God. And so this is not just a societal issue of people are like, man, what happened to Jesus? Golly. It's that this act is, is being cursed by God, being condemned by God, having the blessing of God removed, having death and separation being placed upon you. And Paul would write that language and say that this is what Jesus became on your behalf. 
But I'm not just interested in the physical dynamics of being hung on a tree because that's the way the Romans did it through crucifixion or being hung on a tree because the Old Testament would point to that to being shameful. I'm also interested that the place that the problem started is also the place where the problem is fixed. Because the reason that there's a curse at all, the reason that there's a brokenness at all starts back even where we started our service, reading out of Genesis chapter three that there was a tree in the midst of the garden that we were not supposed to eat from. And we, which is why we read it in the plural, we like Adam and Eve take the sin, f- sinful fruit and ingest it. And we say, we can be God on our own. Again, the danger of sin is to say, you can fix this with your own power. You can do this in your own strength. You've got the ability to make yourself whole. You can make yourself just like God, buy into sin, and it'll get you what it it actually can't afford you. And so the problem starts around a tree where Adam exalts himself to be like God instead of trusting what God would say to him in the first place. And then we see Jesus on Good Friday mocked, beaten, stumbling through the streets to get to the place of the skull. And when there's this, when he's placed on a tree, they would yell out to him, hey, if you're really the son of God, you should come down from there. So he has this moment where he can say, you know what, I'm going to get myself out of this. I'm going to exalt myself to being as the same place of God because that's the identity question that's being asked. Are you who you say you are? Are you one of the people of God? Are you the son of God? Do you have his power? And if you are him, prove it by doing what benefits you the most. And instead, Jesus, for the joy that's set before him, despising the cross and its shame, stays. So that line that we sang, it was my sin that held him there. That's somewhat true. His, your, our sin is certainly the cause But the commitment comes from him saying that the only way that this curse can be broken is that I see this through. That instead of being like Adam who would remove the curse from myself and place it back on everybody else, that he would fully and faithfully submit to the will of God and take the full weight of that upon himself. And Paul would say, because he was willing to be cursed, you get to be blessed. Now, it's 2022. So I recognize that the definition of blessed is a little squirrely right now. Uh, sometimes it's hashtag blessed because you've got a parking spot. I, I don't think that's what Paul's referring to. And, and I know that even in the, in the West, in the church, that when you start talking about blessing, we can go down this weird ro- road where you expect like gold stuff to start, gold dust to start coming out of your air vents. I, I don't think Paul's pointing to that either. I think he's pointing to being amongst the people of God, unified with Christ, getting what the son gets, and therefore you get life in its fullness. That doesn't mean there's not hurt. That doesn't mean there's not pain, but it means that you're not walking through life without the the grace of the Lord Jesus leading you through it. He would say that because of Jesus being willing to be cursed by hanging upon the tree, you are blessed. And therefore the Gentiles, and so um, unless you are uh, biologically Jewish, he's referring to you, now get to receive the promised spirit by faith. And and here's why that's important. Because we talked about it last week. We talked about it earlier in the message. There's nothing external that's gonna fix the problem that sits with us internally. My sin problem isn't something that's outside of me. My lust problem isn't because there are billboards in our city that drive me to start thinking thoughts that I shouldn't think. My anger problem isn't because everybody else on the road is an idiot and they need to just get out of the way so I can drive. My lying problem isn't, well, if the truth wasn't so costly. It actually all comes from inside of me that my soul is bent towards sin, that I have a nature inside of me that because of that first curse of the tree, that I'm bent towards dishonoring and and trying to exalt myself to know better and be better than God, to do it on my own. And nothing outside of me can fix that, but the promised spirit being within me transforms me that I might be able to please God. So Jesus being willing to be cursed brings us to this moment where the tragedy is the solution to the problem where instead of somebody standing back and say, somebody's got to pay, we can stand on this day and say that Jesus has paid it all. 
But instead of looking and saying, what a horrible tragedy, I can't believe that that's the reality, that we can say, oh, what a savior. I'm grateful for the grace that he's given me by the willingness to die. His death has broken my curse. So Jesus fixes the problem where the problem starts, becoming a curse upon a tree. But he also fixes the problem where the problem starts in the midst of my heart and yours. And so on this day, when we come to the place of thinking about what Jesus has done on our behalf, let's not rush past the death to get to the resurrection. Let's not rush past the weight of this is what sin would cost. And he was willing to pay it. That this is the shame that needed to be incurred and he was willing to carry it. That this was the curse that was upon us and he was willing to take that upon his shoulders because we could not carry it upon ours. That Jesus being willing to be hung upon a tree and be cursed by God, that you and I might be made free. And if you don't know Jesus, I recognize that on a, on a good Friday that you may be in town with family and this is a family tradition and this is why you're here. That the recipe is not, okay, if you can back up all those years and start doing the right things to, to pay the debt that's in your account, that all of a sudden you'll be okay. But it's actually those who live by faith, not by their own merit, works, and effort that receive the promise of the Spirit. So can I, can I say to you that if you're here, you're like, I've, not, I've done way too much. There's no way I can make up for all the things that I've done. Don't buy into the lie of sin that would say, if you try harder and do more, you can make yourself like God. Because that'll crush you, not save you. That's the, that's the barb that keeps you, keeps you attached to the curse. But it's the righteous that live by faith. So they say, that here's what I believe, that what Jesus has done is enough, and therefore I put my trust there, not my trust in me, and so therefore, Jesus, I'm giving myself over to you. But let me also say, for the person who's a believer, uh, here's, here's the image that, I, that the Lord gave me years ago. I have these moments where I hear the Lord calling me to submit something to him, to give it over to him. And I dutifully and faithfully walk down and I lay it on the altar and I start walking back and I get about three steps away. And I'm like, all right, let me take that with me just in case. Uh, because I have this habit of, well, God, you got it, but, but, but I got it. You need my help. And I'm fearful that far too often, this is why we spent time here on Sunday, that in the Easter season, because we can dress up the outside, that we neglect what's happening really on the inside. You don't just need the message of Jesus' crucifixion to get in to the people of God. It's what keeps you from going back to the shame of hiding like they did in the garden because you recognize that all of his sacrifice was future forward. So let me, let me say it this way. I don't know you. I don't know what's going to happen next in your life. But here's what I know. If you keep living, you're going to sin again. And Jesus isn't like, Oh gosh, I was not prepared for that. Let me go back to the cross. That once and for all that he's covered the penalty of your sin, which means that you don't need to do something to cover the penalty of your sin. And my fear is we see this moment, this crucifixion, this Good Friday as this one-time thing that we celebrate once a year when it, runs or when it comes around as opposed to this reminder that when I stumble and fail, that I don't go back to trying to, by the works of the law, make myself righteous because it still doesn't work. But instead that I run to the cross and the one that was cursed upon the tree and say, you've fixed this once and for all. Remind me how I should trust you again. And so here's what I want to invite us to. In a moment, we're gonna take the bread and the cup together. And as we do, for those of you that are a believer in Jesus Christ, I want you to think through the, the, the kindness of Jesus to be cursed on your behalf, to allow his body to be broken, to allow his blood to be shed. And maybe you're here and you're thinking to yourself, I don't deserve that. 
it would be foolish if any of us thought that we did. But maybe you're saying, I, I've done too much wrong. I've, I've operated in way too frequently in the same pattern of sin. There is no way possible. I just want to remind you that it's not by the works of the law that you're made righteous. It's by the trust in what Jesus has accomplished that you're made righteous. Not just initially, but over and over and over again. Or maybe you're here and you're not a believer in Jesus Christ. And you're like, is it really that easy? Maybe you're like, hey, hey, homie, there is no free lunch. You're right, there is no free lunch that any man can provide for you in this world. But what's being provided for you in the forgiveness of your sin wasn't free. It cost Jesus being taking on the sin of the world. And those who trust and believe that receive that, not those who earn it. Because sin would convince you, just do more. And more will never be enough. But when you trust Jesus, the price has been paid, the curse has been broken, and access has been given that you could be part of the people of God. And so as we come to the table, if the Lord's doing that in your heart, then you don't, you don't have to move or get up or raise a hand or do anything. You can sit in your seat and say, okay, Lord, you're, you're, you're speaking to me. Forgive me. Make me yours. I trust you. And that's all that's needed. So I want to invite um, our team that's going to help serve the elements to those who haven't received them yet. If that's the case for you, would you shoot your hand up? Because we don't want to unintentionally exclude you. Is there anybody that didn't receive the bread and the cup as they came in? And I'm actually going to need one if somebody could grab me one as well. Because I, thank you, Tom. So as we come to the table together, as we think about the first Good Friday, that several hours before Jesus was sitting in the room with a band of followers. And in that moment, he, he, he's going to break the bread. He's going to give the cup, but then he's going to live out just this opposite way of, of living, this grace that is undeserved. So a few moments after he, after he breaks the bread with them, that he's going to wash the feet. And one of the people that he's washing the feet of is one of the people whose feet are then going to walk out of the room and go betray him. Uh, later, he's going to um, be being mocked by those who are around him. And instead of him saying, Lord, would you help them to understand? Or if it was you and I, Lord, would you take them out? He's like, Lord, would you forgive them for they don't know what they're doing? That um, There's a man who comes to arrest him and one of his disciples grabs a sword and cuts off the dude's ear. And if I'm, get, if I'm being bound in chains, my thing, I'm, not, I'm not healing people that day. Like that, that, that part of the ministry is closed. And yet he would take his hand and put the ear of an enemy back on his head and heal the ones who were actually going to wound him a few moments or a few hours later. That there's this, this countercultural power of Jesus in this moment that instead of giving those what they deserve, he gives them a gift that's so much greater and so much more. But of all the things that we listed, even better than healing people whose ears have fallen off and speaking forgiveness over people who are mocking or washing the feet of a betrayer to sit at a table and say, I'm instituting a meal to remind you how I'm giving all of myself that you might be forgiven of your sins might be the greatest undeserved gift that you and I could receive. And so as we come to the table and remember the night that Jesus was betrayed, for those of you who are believers in Jesus Christ, this is a moment where the victim brings you victory. If you are not a believer in Jesus Christ, man, I, I urge you, I wish, I wish I could preach this as good as it was, but I can't. Jesus is better than my words can, can describe. But if you are not ready yet, 
you're safe here. But I also would say, don't just do this because everybody else is. The appearance, the appearance isn't worth the lack of knowing the truth. And so we'd ask that you would refrain. So on that night, Jesus would take the, ble- the bread and he'd bless it and he'd break it. And he'd give it to his disciples and say that this is my body, which is broken for you. Take, eat, and do this in remembrance of me. And then in a similar manner, he would take the cup and say that this is my blood of the new covenant shed for the remission of sins. Paul, who wrote the letter that from the Galatians, wrote to a different church saying that every time that you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim Jesus' death till he comes. Will you take and drink the cup? Now, church, I want to invite you to worship. I know that whether it's thinking about the weight of Good Friday or a memorial service that you've been to, that most often our response to that is not worship, it's sorrow. But over and again, it feels like the story of Good Friday is that Jesus is taking what is broken and sorrowful and cursed and taking it upon himself that you might have blessing, life, and joy. And so we're going we're gonna to sing together the, the Lord's Prayer. And when his disciples would ask him, hey, how should I pray? And he was like, like this is the way that you pray. It's in the middle of a sermon when he's trying to teach them that this is what life in the kingdom looks like. This is what it looks like to be part of my people. This is how you frame your mind and your attitude and your ambitions. And he would say right in the middle of that, this is how you pray. This is how you anchor your hope and your faith in me. And in that prayer is this request, help, forgive me and help me to forgive. Help me to live out both receiving and giving the grace that you've given me. And I don't know if there's anything better for us to turn our hearts towards on this Good Friday than a moment of saying before the Lord, yes, Lord, I need your grace and help me be a giver of your grace. And so church, will you stand to your feet as I pray and can we sing to the Lord together thinking of his goodness. And so Jesus, I'm grateful for your grace. You would take the curse upon yourself to provide blessing for us. May we receive that faithfully but may we be conduits of it also. That Lord, over and again, I think one of the most startling things in our world is the power of forgiveness. Because like you, we're willing to absorb the wrong of others and give grace in return. And so Lord, would you help us on this Good Friday, not just to think of images of you, but image you to the world that as we sing, asking for you to make it on earth as it is in heaven, that the way that you're going to take this broken earth and make it right is that you are going to multiply your image. You're gonna, you're gonna re-Edenize the world. You're gonna, you're gonna be a faithful gardener. And the way that you did that was that you planted the seed through death. And may that seed of self-denial and humility and forgiveness and grace, would that be planted deep in us? Would there be a level of dying to self in us? Maybe in the the walking before somebody and giving forgiveness that they don't deserve. Would you help us not just receive grace, but give grace? Would we not stand and demand that someone has got to pay but instead, would we be a people that say the debt's been paid? Come in and know his grace. Lord, it's in your name I pray. Amen and amen. Again, thanks for watching this message online. And here's our hope that you didn't just hear the word of God, but that it compels you to follow the way of Jesus. Here's what we mean by that. 
We're not just giving you information, but we believe that there's steps that you take afterwards to obey Jesus, to serve the world around you, to give sacrificially, and to go to others who haven't heard the message. And so one, we would love to know you, particularly if you're in the Southern California area. If you go to kingsharbor.org slash hello, you can send us a digital connect card, and we would love to follow up with you, just get to know you better. But we also hope that you didn't just hear a message and then just stow it away somewhere, but it compels you to obey and follow the way of Jesus. Uh, we pray that you do that in community. That's the best way to live this out. You can live it out. We just don't believe you should live it out alone. Uh, on top of that, we, we believe that this is an opportunity to serve. And whether that's you serving uh, the church or the community around you, that those who follow Jesus reflect Jesus by the way that they serve. And then we would ask that you give. Giving is not something that is uh, just kind of a tradition in the church. It's evidence that you fully trust Jesus in every dimension of your life. And then finally, we're praying that you go, that you would share this with someone else, that if the Lord has impacted you by his word to see Jesus better and love him more deeply, that you'd invite others to do the same by either sharing this message with them or entering into community with them and sharing what the Lord has done. So we're excited to hear from you, to connect with you, and to hear about what the Lord's doing through his word and in your life.